Welcome. It is February 21st, 2012. I'm Aaron Dykes sitting in on the show while Alex is on the road. Of course, his event coming up in Orlando this coming Sunday. Everyone in that area should really think about checking it out. Coming up on the show tonight, we are joined by Bryce Shanka of the 10th Amendment Center to talk about nullification and some amazing legislation that's taking place at the state level to nullify the NDAA. It's already happened in Virginia, and they're working on it in Washington State and many other locations. Stay tuned for that. Then joining us is Adam Kokesh, who just uh, is on the heels of organizing the Veterans for Ron Paul rally, which was a tremendous success. The media was forced to cover it, and they're now more and more forced to acknowledge the fact that the troops have chosen Ron Paul as their candidate. And uh, that is an important issue on the Ron Paul campaign and for liberty in general as we fight to bring ourselves back to a constitutional government. But first, the news. Monsanto BT GMO corn to be sold at Walmart with no indication it is genetically modified. Of course, the entire biotech industry has fought heavily against any labeling for their products, attempting to keep people in the dark and take what all studies show to be pretty much a Trojan horse designed to prevent you from having children and give you organ failure, sterility, cancers, uh, all kinds of other things as it combines with all the other terrible things that have been put into our food supply and into our environment. Uh, so that's an issue to keep an eye on. Ethan Huff of naturalnews.com covered it, uh, saying that Monsanto first unveiled this new variety of GM sweet corn back in August, which rivals Syngenta and other Bilderberg players' GM sweet corn that has already been on the market in limited form for the past 10 years, claiming it would be available to farmers for planting during fall 2011. Now the corn appears to be set to make its debut in Walmart stores by this summer, the summer of 2012, unless massive public outcry is able to convince the multinational retailer to scrap the corn or at least voluntarily label it. Now, if you think it's a losing battle to try to fight the monster that's Walmart that's destroyed so many communities and really uh, contributed significantly to driving down wages and to over, uh, shipping jobs overseas to China and other locales, uh, don't give up yet because Walmart has been pressured to carry a lot of organic products and uh, really voting with your dollars does speak volumes in this GM fight and it's one of the main tools we have. Of course, most of the GM corn, which is over 90%, is on the market in the form of processed food derivatives. High fructose corn syrup is a major component uh, and as are other corn additives like corn oil, corn starch, and other uh, so forth and so on additives from corn. Soy is a big one too that's completely infiltrated processed food products. One of the major reasons you should avoid them and there's very little way to even tell what's in there because of the deceptive way it's labeled. But it will be a major setback if GM corn is allowed to come to market and if people begin to eat it up without even knowing what they're getting into. Now here's a Venn diagram uh, that our great researchers have put together of just a few of the people who've infiltrated government, who had a position at Monsanto, whether it's board member or a lawyer or a lobbyist for the firm, there's so many. Uh, one name I noticed is not on the list is Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice. He was at Monsanto. Uh, you've got people like Michael Taylor, who's been in and out and in and out of government. Now he's one of the most important people at the FDA. He was a vice president at Monsanto, and before that, a legal representative and a lobbyist for Monsanto. And even Hillary Clinton is on this list. She used to work for the Rose Law Firm, law firm which represented Monsanto, and she was also on the board of Walmart. So you can see the great uh, powers coming together, Monsanto, Walmart, getting together on the GMO issue, how dangerous it could be, and how infiltrated it is. The FDA, the USDA, so many other positions uh, in government. The regulators that are supposed to protect us are actually completely bought and paid for by Monsanto and other biotech companies. And we really need to take a closer look at this and have an honest conversation and stop this before it's too late. We just got to stop this. Now, Paul Watson has written another report. He loves reporting on these big brother technologies because it's it's just being phased in with no one saying no ever. Minority report style advertising rolled out in London and this technology will feature $60,000 ads that I guess target individuals at places like bus stations and will display on screen uh, something that's a cross between an iPad and an Xbox Connect playing a 40 second video message when a female's face is scanned but only a brief message if a man walks past 
we're not giving men and boys the choice to see the full ad on this occasion so they get a glimpse of what it's like to have basic choices taken away, said Mari Staunton, chief executive of Plan UK, the organization featured in the ad. And that spin itself, the point is they're going to phase this in in a commercial capacity, hope to reach acceptance as governments covertly use this, and eventually it's going to be all out in the open. They have complete biometrics. In the case of this particular example, the technology supposedly only identifies things like gender uh, or race or ethnicity to try to target ads uh, based on those models. And it's creepy, and let's hope people reject it. Now, you've also got Kurt Nemo's report, Scary NSA Propaganda, Anonymous Cyber Attack Will Take Down the Power Grid. Uh, however, they point out, after all the scaremongering, that it is not easy to disrupt the power grid in the United States. Most of the systems use proprietary operating systems and applications not readily available for study by your average hacker. That's according to Michael Tonge, uh, with a link there to his source, Power Grid or Drinking Water Systems and Networks are not connected to the public internet. You've heard Alex talk about this before and all the other experts we've had on. And uh, this Michael Tonge guy goes on to say, even in places like the United States where there isn't much you can't find online, you're not gonna be able to get in depth and detail. Uh, you need to turn off the lights with a simple network connection. You're gonna have to deploy national level resources. Now with that in mind, that doesn't mean we're not gonna see things shutting down. It just means when you see them shut down, you know who's really behind it. It's the people at the NSA who are trying to ramp up their cybersecurity budget, trying to create a sock puppet. Anonymous is perfect because there's no one name or face behind it. Even WikiLeaks is not as useful as uh, Anonymous could be if manipulated by the very people trying to gain power under the Cybersecurity Act. Now, General Keith Alexander is someone to watch because he was at the past several Bilderberg conferences. They've had the cybersecurity agenda for many years, and it looked like a watershed moment last year in St. Moritz at the Bilderberg Collective because you had so many high-tech people there uh, in the year that we saw SOPA and PIPA legislation pushed, in the year that we saw the ACTA Treaty pushed, and now uh, more fear-mongering that there could be a cyber attack. So keep that in mind. General Al Keith Alexander, the man who reporters inside Bilderberg said, was screaming and cursing that damn Kucinich, because at the time, Dennis Kucinich was uh, leading an effective opposition against the Libya war before it really got off the ground. Uh, in other news, Urian Maison uh, is one of our best contributors. He knows so much about eugenics, and he's written Eugenics Effective by Incrementalism, and uh, just fleshing out a sub-point about the ancient eugenics movement in a booklet written in 1913 by Alan G. Roper, uh, who really tries to legitimize the modern eugenics movement uh, by citing all the other societies who engaged in killing off people that they didn't want, uh, diseased and effective people. But what does he really mean by eugenics uh, done through incrementalism? Well, he says the biocratic thought is simply this, in order to achieve total control over the body and mind. They want total control over our bodies and minds. By presenting themselves as well-doers, the biocrats raise the perfect guys behind which they can exercise eugenic power in full impunity. But why would they use incrementalism? Who else uses incrementalism? Well, that is the key philosophy of the Fabian Socialist. If you look back to people like H.G. Wells, people like the Huxley brothers, people like George Bernard Shaw, they were fully in support and some of the key players of that early 20th century eugenics movement. You've heard myself and Alex talk so much about it. It's all in Endgame. Uh, but it's important to know that their main tactic is working very slowly. You don't have the sudden despotism uh, of flashy regimes like Hitler. You move step by step until people accept it and don't even remember where they came from or realize where they're going. But besides the obvious goal of trying to depopulate uh, the planet, one thing eugenics is seeking to accomplish incrementally is legitimizing total state power, the power over life and death. They wrote about this, the Caltech researchers who are working for the Rockefeller Foundation to try to uh, uh, affect the total biology, the total life cycle of people. And if they can legitimize that, the state can do anything. If they can decide who lives and who dies, who has the right to breed, they can just 
absolutely call the shots as they please. And that's why they want to incrementally seal us on this eugenics agenda to make the state God. And you also see that it helps them supersede national sovereignty, local and regional authorities, and more. So another great report from Urian Mason. He's the one who brought to light the documents about the Rockefeller Foundation uh, developing over a period of more than 30 years an anti-fertility vaccine and so much more. Now, uh, we have exclusive video right now from Kurt Haskell. You heard him on the Alex Jones Show this week. Uh, Rob Dew went up to interview him uh, where he lives outside of Detroit earlier this week or last week. And uh, we're going to play just a few minutes of that exclusive video now. The uh, key witness to the underwear bomber that they're now using to legitimize the TSA's total takeover after he pleaded guilty. So here it is. That's right. Do I need to backtrack at all, or you think we? Kurt Haskell, I'm an attorney in Michigan, and uh, you know I was on the flight with the underwear bomber on Christmas Day 2009. Passengers describe a terror attack and the arrest of a suspect who tried to blow up a plane as it landed at Metro Airport. We heard a loud pop, then a bit of a smoke. Sounded first like a balloon being popped. All of a sudden, heard some screams and flight attendants ran up and down the, the aisles and... Everything's crazy, people are screaming, there's fire on the plane. So there was a lady shouting back and she was saying uh, things like, uh, what are you doing, what are you doing? Um, and uh, at that moment, I was sure I was going to die. And when I was at uh, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam on Christmas Day, uh, my wife and I were coming back from a vacation we had in Africa and this was our connecting flight back to Detroit. And there weren't two seats together to, to sit at while we were waiting for our flight. So we sat by the gate on the floor playing cards. And when we were playing cards, I looked up and what caught my eye was a pair of men walking up to the counter. And one looked like a, a wealthier Indian man to me and the other looked like a poor African. I thought he was a teenager, but apparently he was a little older then. He looked like a poor African teenager. He only had on jeans and a white T-shirt in the middle of winter. And, uh, you know, I, I thought they were an odd pair, so I just kind of watched them as we were playing cards. And they went to the counter together, and the, the Indian-looking man spoke, and what he said was, this man needs to get on the flight, referring to the uh, African teenager. Um, uh, but he doesn't have a passport. And then the girl working at the counter said, well, you have to have a passport to get on the flight. And then the Indian man said, well, he's from Sudan. We do this all the time. And, th and that's a, an exact word for word quote. And she said something along the lines of, well, you know, I'll have to refer you to a manager or something like that. And I think she did something on her computer. And then she sent the two of them down a hallway and they walked down the hallway together, uh, which was in a restricted area. And uh, with, they walked down there without an escort, and then you know, I quit watching at that point. At the Amsterdam airport, I didn't really notice anything that rose any suspicion with me. Uh, you know, I, I saw what I did, but at the time it didn't mean anything to me. I'm just thinking, oh, here's someone that's not gonna be boarding our flight. So, you know, and if you think of it, how I was looking at it at the time, it really didn't mean anything. Uh, it meant so little, I didn't even tell Lori about it until it became important later on. Coming in for a landing into Detroit, uh, and the pilot came on the, the loudspeaker and said, uh, you know, flight attendants, take your seats. We're, we're you know, we're gonna be preparing for landing soon. And just a few seconds after that, a flight attendant walked by my chair, by my seat, and I could hear a mumble, something smells like smoke, 
something along those lines. And I looked up, I had been looking at the, the monitor on the back of my seat to see, you know, to see our approach. And I looked up and I could see smoke coming from uh, the left side of the plane. And there was a bit of a skirmish going on. This was a plane that had two aisles. So this was on, occurring on the left side of the left aisle and I was on the right aisle. So I ran up the right aisle to get a better look. And uh, it, it, the smoke didn't last too long and then a fire broke out and a, a man was being hauled away into the first class area. There really wasn't a fight going on or anything, just someone grabbed him and hauled him away. So um, I didn't know at this point if it was a terrorist attack or what, what it was. I was more concerned about the fire that was spreading real fast. Uh, it spread to two seats and then the floor and then up the wall. And uh, you know, I went back to my seat and Lori asked me what was going on. I said, the plane's on fire. And uh, you know, we watched it as it was continuing to spread and passengers were jumping on it, patting it down. And uh, a flight attendant grabbed the fire extinguisher and ran over and put it out. You know, maybe it, the whole thing lasted a minute or two. It wasn't real long, but it was enough you know, where we thought that was it, that our plane was going to go down in flames. The passenger aboard this plane arriving in Detroit was planning to blow up the aircraft, but the explosive device apparently failed. A Delta spokeswoman says the passenger was immediately subdued and was being questioned Friday evening. Authorities initially believed the passenger had set off firecrackers causing some minor injuries. Flight 253 was carrying 278 passengers and was inbound to Detroit from Amsterdam. Uh, when we landed, it was interesting uh, for a few reasons. First of all, you know, I thought we were just going to stop. The emergency chutes were going to open and we're all going to jump out. But that's not what happened. We landed. We taxied right up to the gate. Uh, several officers came on board, you know, and I don't know who they're with. They're, they're TSA, Detroit Police, FBI, I don't really know. Uh, and they all, or a couple of them started yelling, saying, sit down and shut up, you're not getting off the plane, get it back in your seats, that kind of thing. And they all went into the first class area. And after maybe 20 minutes or so, the underwear bomber, who he, who he's known as now, you know, obviously we didn't know who he was at that point, got escorted off in handcuffs. And he stood in the, left, the front of the left aisle for maybe 20 seconds or so, and I got a good look at him then. And that's when I made the connection that it was the, the same person I saw in Amsterdam before we boarded. And I turned to Lori and I said, uh, holy cow, you know, I think I maybe have seen something important. Uh, they took him off the plane, and then... Uh, there, there was a powder all over the place by where he sat. We got our carry-on bags, which to me I thought was another mistake. Being an attorney, I thought, you know, they're destroying a crime scene here and not knowing if there's an accomplice, another bomb or whatever. And we all kind of trampled right through by where he was sitting, you know, right through this powder um, that was all over the place. Again, destroying the crime scene, but nobody seemed to care about it. Uh, and then we were taken into the terminal, and uh, we were held in a, a baggage claim area that had been evacuated, and just passengers from our flight were there. And, uh, you know, we were told to st stand along this wall. We couldn't make any calls. We couldn't eat anything, drink anything, text anyone, use the bathroom. We couldn't do anything. We weren't really given much information except we're told to stand here. And after about an hour or so, some bomb sniffing dogs were brought in and one of the dogs caught on a, a smell of the bag of another Indian man who was standing maybe 20 feet away from me you know with the group of all his passengers so I would say most of the passengers saw this happen not just me and the dog sat down and one of the officers came over to the man and took him into a side room to be interviewed and they were in there a long time maybe an hour and then he came out of the room with an officer and was handcuffed, and then they took him away. At the same time, a different officer came up to the rest of us passengers and said something, uh, something along these lines. I can't remember exactly word for word, but it was something like, I'm sure that you saw what just happened. You're not safe here. 
you know, for obvious reasons, we're moving, moving you to a different area and out of here. And then we we're all escorted out of this uh, baggage claim area and into this long hallway where we were at for a few more hours. Uh, during this time, again, we still weren't able to use the bathroom or make calls or eat or anything like that. And after a few hours, uh, it, the person I would say was the lead investigator, investigator came up and said, we now have those responsible for this in custody, those plural, not the man or him. And then he went on to say, we're going to be doing quick interviews of all the rest of you, and then you'll be free to go. And then we're escorted back into the larger area, baggage claim area, where we initially were. And then we had to stay in the line to do interviews before we could leave, and that's when I told the FBI what I had witnessed in Amsterdam for the first time. Turning now to the economic front, we have two interesting cases in the planned, yes, I said planned collapse of Europe uh, through the whole financial crisis situation. Now, the first is a positive story. It's Iceland's Viking Victory, written by Am Ambrose Evans Pritchard at the London Telegraph, one of the few mainstream reporters who actually knows what he's talking about, at least based on what I've read in the past. And his article starts with, Congratulations to Iceland as the first country to suffer the full force of the global financial crisis. Iceland successfully completed a three-year IMF-supported rescue program in August 2011, and goes on to explain some of the ways that they changed their markets, including a contraction of the 6.5% 6 of GDP deficit down to only 0.5% in 2011, and appears to be on track to gain a fiscal surplus by 2012, headed into 2014. Also, he reports that the OECD's latest forecast said growth would be 2.4% this year, following 2.9% in 2011. 11 already on the positive side. Meanwhile, unemployment is scheduled to fall from 7% to 6.1% this year and 5.3% in 2013. Now, this is important uh, for all the reasons that he doesn't point out in the article, and that is that essentially Iceland said no to the phony fraudulent debt put on by the big banks through the derivatives uh, laid on them and which they tried to sell to the public and thankfully, that country was able to organize enough opposition and simply say no to that. They still had a lot of uh, trouble with their economy, but they have already been able to come out of it, much as uh, Argentina did when their economy crashed, if I understand the parallels. And so uh, Pritchard Evans goes on to discuss how the strategy of devaluation behind capital controls has rescued the economy, how the country has held together its Nordic welfare system and preser preserved social cohesion uh, and is slowly prospering again, though private debt weighs heavily. Nobody further, further, he states, nobody is forcing the elected government out of office or appointing technocrats as prime minister. Now, that is all important stuff because no, no system is going to be perfect, but they were able to avoid the worst just by saying no. We've had on the experts, we've had on people like Brigitte jones uh the Iceland representative, on the show to discuss this stuff. And this isn't even so much about their welfare system or whether or not that is a good system. It's the fact that they didn't allow themselves to be the target of a planned uh, Bilderberg-oriented economic conspiracy and uh, to allow these austerity measures designed to cripple the country per and bring it permanently under greater European control. And that is the major success of Iceland. I don't claim to have all the details. It's covered really well, actually, in that documentary Inside Job about the whole banking collapse, if you haven't seen that. But on the other front, you have Greece, uh, which probably should have learned the lessons of Iceland, but instead had such incredible pressure bought, brought upon it. Uh, they've already had riots. They've already had the first round of bailouts. They've already had a uh, switching of prime ministers and economic ministers. And now they have sealed the deal on the latest Greek bailout. Uh, 
in the name of 130 billion euro, which is approximately 172 billion in U.S. dollars. Uh, Eurozone finance ministers agreed to the 130 billion euro rescue for Greece Tuesday to avert an imminent chaotic default after forcing Athens to commit to unpopular cuts and private bondholders to take bigger losses. And you've seen that population completely revolt against this stuff, but the bankers said they were going to bring them under reign anyway. Uh, but they, of course, go on to say the Greek finance minister, uh, Evangelos Venizelos in Athens, said a nightmare scenario was avoided. It is maybe the most important deal in Greece's post-war history. You've also got the technocrat who was appointed, not elected, Mario Monti in Italy praising the deal. And uh, the article out of Reuters also notes that Greece will now be placed under permanent surveillance by an increased European presence on the ground. So basically, that country is going to be brought into total receivership under the guise of this bailout that's not even going to solve the problems of that country or of European, uh, of the EU in general. In fact, it's probably going to threaten further collapse, but it staves off the crisis for the time being because there's no default now. Uh, as you see with Iceland, just saying no probably would have been a lot better. But don't ask me. I'm not an economist. Listen to the technocrats and the important people in government and pseudo-government positions. Now, we turn now to the quote of the day before our interviews coming up after the break with Bryce Shanka of the Tenth Amendment Center and, of course, Adam Kokesh of Adam versus the Man. And uh, that quote is from Adam Weishaupt. And what an interesting history it is with the Illuminati, by the way. He said, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always concealed by another name and another occupation. Always hidden, that's their motto. And if you don't think that tactic is still in use today, if you don't think there really are conspiracies, I urge you to take a closer look. We're swimming in the evidence of it. I've been here six years. I've seen that happening. And uh, I hope you're catching on, too, if you're a new listener or, or if you're not quite convinced of what's going on. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. Signing these evil 1776 flags. Doesn't get any more out of control than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's pretty un American what we're doing here at InfoWars.com. I mean, not only are we promoting liberty, but we're selling 1776 flags. Now that is Al Qaeda. We were brought up loving our country and our constitution. That in the United States of America, we were free. And that's an attitude that we've tried to instill in our children. I met my wife while uh, in the Air Force. I was a combat pilot in Vietnam. I served in Desert Storm as a commander. When I graduated from the academy, I took the oath of office. Uh, and as a commander, I administered that oath to many people. Now I, I wonder about the understanding people have of our Constitution, and I think about our candidates for President of the United States. Uh, it's interesting to see the support Ron Paul gets from the military. And if we think back to the code of conduct uh, and people raising their right hand that they were going to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, why would those same people support in great numbers Ron Paul. I think it's because they know that he supports the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't mean you have to go to war to do it. Uh, it means you have to understand what the Constitution is and be a supporter inside of your own country, whether you're in the military or not, of that Constitution and make the United States strong. And Ron Paul does that. That's his feeling. That's his thrust. And that's why if you look at the percentages that support him and the military, it's huge. Why is that? Because they've raised their right hands and they're putting their lives on the line for us here in the United States. And they know that Ron Paul does the same.
We are back from break, and in this segment, we turn to Ron Paul news. There's been what I would consider another watershed moment in his tremendous 2012 campaign that's had a lot of victories, psychological and concrete. And that is the Veterans for Ron Paul rally, which was held at the White House. ABC News covered it, but only in their blog. They covered how current and former service members staged a rally outside the White House today in support of Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul. Several hundred troops and their supporters attended the event. At least that's what they reported after they corrected it. They made another classic Ron Paul mistake, as the media seems to get so much wrong in regard to his campaign, as they earlier reported that only dozens showed up. However, there were several hundred comments in their own article pointing out their mistake, and they were forced to uh, create an update and a retraction, where they said a previous version of this blog post incorrectly listed the number of attendees at the event. They, of course, regret the error. Uh, but they also cite the fact that Ron Paul has an unusually high percentage of supporters in the military as compared with the other candidates. And it is important that they covered it. But the larger establishment media did ignore this march. Uh, people like Adam Kokesh led it. Uh, it was joined by all kinds of military people. And they're really speaking out and saying, we don't agree with where this foreign policy is going. Among other things, we don't want a new war with Iran. And here's footage of that rally, the stuff you didn't see on the mainstream news. It was, it's this imagery of uh, active duty and former uh, veterans coming together, saying no to the war, saying yes to Ron Paul, that the media chose not to show you. You didn't see these images. And I don't know if it's in this clip, but they dramatically did an about face outside the White House, uh, symbolizing their opposition to Obama's continuation of the war. Uh, and they had a moment of silence for all the soldiers who've died in combat under Obama's term. And furthermore, of all the soldiers and former soldiers who've committed suicide uh, as they've come to grips with very strong, very tough to deal with emotional issues. And we're going to be joined by Adam Kokesh momentarily to discuss that even more. But Steve Watson has put out a report that even defense contractors are supporting Ron Paul for president. We've already covered how the military, the active duty military, have contributed more to Ron Paul than any other candidate, way more than Mitt Romney, way more than Santorum, way more than Newt Gingrich, and even more than Obama. But he even has the support of defense contractors. Why is that if Ron Paul wants to freeze military spending and stop the corruption? Well, it's because it's from individual donors, people who understand. Mitt Romney actually does have a lot of defense contractor donations, uh, not that far behind Paul's numbers. But if you look at the number of donators, that's where the real story is. Ron Paul had at least 824 individual contributors who averaged about $215 per person, almost certainly regular people working for uh, working stiff wages, while Mitt Romney's contributions were fewer individuals and a higher dollar contribution, I think more than $800 if I read this article correctly. And that tells a story in itself. Obama's got a lot of contractor contributions too, but none of them as much as Ron Paul. People understand where this is going. Of course, it was in Defense News on February 20th of this year. Uh, it says, Ron Paul may not support increasing defense spending, but he's certainly receiving the support of those who work in the defense industry. And then they go on to cite FEC filings that record just more contributions, more than 177000 for Ron Paul. Will the media begin to report on this? Is that damn breaking? And of course, here is the chart of the military donations for 2011. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, Ron Paul has 95,000 uh, donors, Obama 72,000. But the other GOP candidates, Romney has only 13,000 in donations from active military. Gingrich and Santorum even less. Santorum not even breaking 1,000. Is it any wonder with the kind of foreign policy they're pushing versus the vision Ron Paul has for this country? And so we are joined now by Adam Kokesh to talk about the march by the troops for Ron Paul and the effect it's had. Uh, thanks for joining us, Adam. Hey, my pleasure. Uh, so give us your overall impression of the event, how many people turned out, and let's talk about the uh, various factors of media coverage on this, because I think it's become significant. Sure, no, I appreciate that. And it has become really significant because what we saw yesterday was just the warm up, just the start for Veterans for Ron Paul 2012 because the message of the event was Ron Paul is the choice of the troops. 
And if the Republican Party isn't willing to listen to that message, if we can't get Ron Paul the nomination, we can't ensure that he is our next commander in chief, then it might all be for naught. And so we are going to be marching on the Republican National Convention in Tampa Bay later this year. What we did yesterday was blow a hole in the military industrial complex and the establishment. And I apologize for my voice being a little rough here, but we had an incredible time with over 400 troops that marched in that formation, active duty soldiers and veterans. We also had several squads from Fort Meade that were there from, uh, from the intelligence community within the military who were in civilian attire and in, in their attempt to, to observe the regulations to the T, only participated as observers alongside the formation. But we had a lot of active duty guys marching there with us, so we were very grateful for that. But like I said, we blew a hole through this thing that a lot of other veterans and active duty troops are going to be following us through. There were a lot of people announcing their support internationally for this. Guys and, and gals at, at bases overseas made videos to promote this event. So now, since we did something in a month and a half of preparation and planning with just two guys, myself and Nathan Cox, when we started this thing, and we ended up with, like I said, somewhere between four and 500 in this formation and thousands that would have been there if it wasn't for the warning from the military, maybe if we had had a little more help from the mainstream media. But when we go in Tampa, we go march in Tampa, we're not starting with two veterans. We're starting with thousands. We're starting with over mm -hmm. 500 that were there yesterday that were willing to show up to do the work, to get the word out, to support Ron Paul. Now we've got six months. It looks like we're coming to a brokered convention after the first round of voting in Tampa Bay. Mitt Romney is most likely not going to be the nominee, and all of those delegates at the convention are going to be unbound delegates at that point. And for the second round of voting, they're going to get to vote their conscience. And we're going to be there as Veterans for Ron Paul 2012 surrounding the convention. We're going to be marching on the RNC. And if they want to disregard the voice of the troops, if they want to say they support the troops, but we're not going to listen to them, they're going to have to do it to our faces in Florida. Well, you mentioned it in passing, and I know our InfoWars readers know, uh, who check the website every day, but other people may have missed it. Uh, they sent out a memo warning people not to show up in uniform at this event, uh, trying to intimidate them out of their free speech and their right to political expression. Why is the system so afraid uh, of troops coming together in support of Ron Paul? Maybe it's an obvious question. Yeah, well, the, you know, there, there, there's one thing in particular about what we did yesterday that I think particularly discredits the entire paradigm of our current foreign policy and the strategy of policing the world and liberal nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is that when we got to the White House, we did an about face and a symbolic repudiation of that foreign policy to turn our backs on the White House and President Obama. But at that point, we held a flag folding ceremony and held a hand salute to a folded flag for as many seconds as troops who have committed suicide while Barack Obama was their commander in chief. And that alone, the fact that those statistics are in record numbers right now, the troops are coming home and not just getting out and committing suicide, staying on active duty. And as Barack Obama is their commander in chief, committing suicide, taking their own lives in desperation because of their role in our foreign policy. It's not just the strains of repeated deployments. It's coming home and not being able to say that the buddies you saw get blown up by IDs died for a good cause. And because of that, we got that email that was sent out by a Navy attorney just a, a few weeks or a few days before the event. We're really grateful for that. Like I said, you know, we were, uh, we were cruising around all the bars, strip clubs, pawn shops, and uh, tattoo parlors here in the D.C. area trying to collect all the active duty emails one at a time, and we're having a hell of a time of it. But this uh, Navy attorney saved us all the work and sent out the email to promote our event. He even included the Facebook uh, event page link in there. So, I, you know, if anything, I think that helped. But more importantly, a lot of the guys who are on active duty, like Corporal Jesse Thorson, who spoke at the Ron Paul event in Iowa after he was cut off by CNN's live feed mysteriously going out after yeah. saying, Israel could take care of herself and, and we shouldn't be starting a war with Iran. Well, there are guys like that saying, screw it. It doesn't matter. You just drew the line in the sand and we know what side we're on. We're on the side with Ron Paul. We're on the side of peace. We're on the side of freedom. We're on the side of defending America. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that the people who are willing to put their lives in the line to defend this country want a commander in chief who's going to be decisive, who's going to put America's security first, 
and who is only going to send us into harm's way with a clear mission where we can go win a war and come home, or as he would call it, a constitutional declaration of war. And the only candidate that even comes close to measuring up to that standard is Ron Paul. The only one who comes close. And, and what you said sounds like a strong statement based on the way things have been going for decades, but it ought to be just common sense. Of course, it has to be a constitutionally declared war with a clear mission. I mean, just common sense. Now, it's worth mentioning that ABC News covered your rally, the Veterans for Ron Paul rally at the White House was their headline. And they reported, uh, I guess by accident, as so many Ron Paul accidents uh, happen in media coverage, that only dozens showed up. And then they got hundreds of comments pointing out how it was not dozens, it was many hundreds of people. And they were forced to retract and print a correction. Got it here, update a previous version of the blog posted incorrectly, listed the number of attendees at the event, and they of course regret the error. Uh, the system is scared, but I think it's all just breaking through. I think it's too late. Oh yeah, like I said, we blew a hole in this thing. And a lot of people are gonna march, be marching through behind us. But as you pointed out, ABC covered the event. Now, when most people hear ABC News, they don't go, oh yes, they have a blog, don't they? Because I think they also have a TV network and they didn't provide any video coverage whatsoever of what was obviously a very visual presentation, a very visual event. Uh, they didn't do that. We got that story picked up by Drudge. We're very grateful for that, that mainstream token of support was picked up and was, was, was carried in the, story, in, the, in the news of the day. But uh, it, it was really, if anything, token coverage. And as you pointed out, a, a, I, I, dozens, I mean, we had, we were eight squads across, eight squads by about 50 deep. We're, we're working on an exact count right now, but clearly it was it may, maybe a little over 500, but, but between four and 500 for this formation. So to say dozens, is, is an obvious slam and an attempt to downplay this event and, and to, dis, uh, to, to, to you know, try to disenfranchise the voice of the troops who we know have overwhelmingly supported Ron Paul in terms of campaign contributions, having received more than all other candidates combined from active duty. It's this inconvenient little fact that the mainstream media doesn't want to acknowledge because it doesn't fit in their paradigm. But I think, that's, I think that's breaking too, Adam, because I know you've personally been covering that for months. I think you may have been among the first uh, to at least take it into the national conversation. And here it is uh, from today, or rather yesterday's news, Defense News, Obama-Paul lead in defense contributions. Of course, Ron Paul has even more than Obama. And I think that media dam is breaking too. Uh, people are having to acknowledge what's happening. And I would imagine troops are even more upset than ever about our crazy foreign policy with Iran, Syria, the prospect of World War III all on the table. Well, let me just say, there are a lot of people who have reacted to this and said, well, we gotta get on the phone with CNN, we gotta get on the phone with NBC and ABC, and all, the, all the, the mainstream networks, and uh, we gotta beg them to, to cover our event, we have to beg them to connect with their audience, you know? And, and I, I think when, when things like this happen and the mainstream media doesn't cover them, a lot of people are inclined to ask why and say, well, well where, where did I hear about this? And, oh, I heard about it through YouTube. I heard about it from the Adam versus the Man YouTube channel. We got a video up there right now with uh, really the, the essential, the quintessential summary of, of, of the march in terms of the action shots for that. Uh, we, you know, we heard about it from InfoWars. We yeah. heard about it from the internet. And I just wanna say that you can't trust the mainstream media to give you the full picture. You can't trust the mainstream media to give you the information that you need. So don't go begging to them. Don't go crying to those dinosaurs of the old corporate media. Start tuning in somewhere else. You know, and no one can be trusted to give you a complete worldview, but I very much appreciate Alex Jones for bringing me on InfoWars last week, for everybody with InfoWars Nightly News for helping promote this event, for bringing me on tonight, because you're showing that you're the ones that care about the people, that you're the ones that care about delivering an honest message. And I, I think your listeners and your viewers are smart enough to know that they can't trust any single source, even, even yours, and I encourage everybody to consume news with a critical mind, to get their news from a variety of sources. You know, and, and I'm not with Adam versus the man presenting an entire worldview as, as Alex Jones is, but you can do that. You can look at infowars.com, you can listen to the Alex Jones radio show, you can get a sense of, at least from Alex Jones, this is the essential information that I need to know about what is going on in the world today. I hope to be expanding my operation personally into that and adding a radio show or a podcast um, and if I can just get one more plug in, AdamVersusTheMan.com is 
where the uh, conversation about that is happening at our forums. But like I said, I'm mm -hmm. grateful for Alex Jones. I'm grateful for everybody in InfoWars for really doing the job of the people's media when the mainstream media, when they, with the establishing corporate media isn't doing its job. But, uh, you know, I, I almost hesitate to say Alex Jones versus the mainstream because now your operation there is turning into something that is so powerful and so massive that right. you're right in the mainstream and the mainstream is turning to the internet and that's where the future of independent media is that's where the future of information and i appreciate the plug and everything adam for infowars i want to bring this up because i was at the event with alex over the weekend he spoke in dallas to a packed house and a lot of those people were military because they came forward in the question and answer sessions and uh, Alex mentioned it in the speech, too, who has ever seen a pro Mitt Romney sticker, a pro Gingrich sticker, a pro Santorum sticker? They're a rare find, if anywhere out there. And uh, the people in the military came forward to say the same thing, that they're talking to people at the base. Most of those who support any candidate are behind Ron Paul. And in particular, many of them are outraged and very upset about the NDAA and more than ever awoken to the issue of not complying with the illegal orders, not going along with this slide into total despotism and tyranny. I think the military is waking up and uh, that's probably going to be the biggest factor in reclaiming our republic if they don't Absolutely. go along with this, that Oath Keepers mission. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very proud to be a member of Oath Keepers. I think their mission is absolutely essential. And for those that don't know, Oath Keepers is encouraging people on active duty, uh, both within the military and in the law enforcement community, to honor their oath to the Constitution before any illegal orders they may receive. But I just, it, it's always so heartwarming when you, when you get so many veterans together and active duty guys who, who are passionate about this cause, because it's a real community of, of people who have woken up to the message of liberty, who have woken up to the reality of our foreign policy. And it's a lot of guys who are hurting too. It's a lot of guys dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of pain and regret, a lot of issues to deal with their own military service. And so to, to see that coming together last night was, was really beautiful, uh, it was, especially the after party. And I just want to thank everybody who made that possible, Ian Chiaffi, Gigi Bowman, and all the artists, Amy Allen, Jordan Page, uh, Golden State, Rebel Inc. for coming out. Really, they just played their hearts out for us last night. Obviously, I lost my voice mostly singing along, but I, I, I want to share one one exchange that i had with uh, a young active duty marine lance corporal who is in the intelligence community i, I won't really say any, anything more to reveal his identity but he's in a unit with about 520 marines and he has access to cipernet sipr the uh, internet the government's secret internet for for military and government purposes and he said that that was what turned him to ron paul the things that he was seeing going out over the internet uh, the secret internet, that is, reports from commanders in the field um, talking about incidents that were going to get covered up, things that they knew they couldn't release to the public. And what he told me, and this is really, really just, uh, you know, heartwarming for me in a personal sense, I guess. He said that of the 520 Marines in his unit, every single one of them knew me by name as a result of this event. And most of them were Ron Paul supporters. It's great, Adam, uh, what you put together this, with this event. We're glad it's going to move forward with other events. I hope it becomes like a We Are Change and Oath Capers thing where it's decentralized and people everywhere are talking about this issue. I think it's time to hear from individual military members. We've heard uh, from the sellout scumbag people at the top military brass level uh, who could just go along with these hijacked foreign policy agendas. I think it's time we hear from the real troops who've been on the ground, seen all the hypocrisies and abuses. And I think that conversation, even if people don't totally agree with where we come from at InfoWars or where you come from at Adam versus the man, uh, I think that conversation uh, will lead to the real answers. Absolutely. But let me just say one final plug here, because this is this is really important. It's not just the ongoing thing. We have a certain sense of urgency right now with Ron Paul running for president, the opportunity that that represents, like one that we have never seen before in human history to make the most powerful man on the planet, the one who would exercise the least amount of power over you. And we are marching on the RNC, the Republican National Convention in Florida, August 27th to August 30th as Veterans for Ron Paul. So to all the veterans and active duty members uh, in the audience listening right now, watching this, please mark your calendars. Prepare to be in Tampa Bay in Florida, August 27th to the 30th. At some point in there, Veterans for Ron Paul 2012 will be a presence. We will be marching on the convention. We will be making it clear 
to the Republican Party that Ron Paul is the choice of the troops. And if they want to nominate someone else and slap us all in the face, they're going to have to do it right in front of us, right in front of the national media, in front of the entire world, and reveal that the, neo the neocons, the establishment, the party hacks don't support the troops. <laughs> it's going to make such a mockery of all their demonization of Ron Paul and his foreign policy. Uh, thanks for joining us, Adam. Adam versus the man and what, March to Washington? Is that still a viable website? No, we, you know what? We have a Facebook page, Veterans for Ron Paul 2012. I've Veterans, got my yeah. page and, of course, adamversustheman.com. I apologize. We haven't had the first official planning meeting for this. We just decided last night that, well, I just decided that I was going to be doing it and going to invite people to join me. So we're going to be figuring out the framework for this and putting out the call. We're going to need people to help spread the message every way we can and to get their butts down to Florida. Well, we'll talk to you in the future, Adam. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And we're going to take another break, but we'll be back with more. Stay tuned on the InfoWars Nightly News. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at Infowars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at Infowars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. The craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. And we are back from break. As you know from our coverage, there's a number of states that are willing to take on the NDAA issue of indefinite detention of American citizens. And uh, one of the states that's working on legislation is Washington State. Uh, reps like Matt Shea are working on that legislation. And they're working with uh, the 10th Amendment Center. And so we are joined now to flesh out that issue and talk about its implications by the Deputy Director of the 10th Amendment Center, Bryce Shanka. Thanks for joining us, Bryce. Thank you, Aaron. Always good to be here. Uh, so obviously, uh, glad you could join us. Obviously, a lot of people are concerned about the implications, the slippery slope of total government power, the ability to black bag someone and put them in a hole that, you know, who knows if they're ever going to resurface, no right to do process, no trial, uh, not even any formal accusations, perhaps, under this law. Uh, do you see the same crazy implications under NDAA? Yeah, well, basically what we're talking about here is you know uh, a common scene in Iran, uh, like a van pulls up, puts a bag over somebody's head uh, after a bunch of guys jump out, and then they throw them in the van and, and drive off, and that person's never seen again. This is what we've always associated with dictatorships uh, all my life, and, uh, and places that were full of quote unquote bad guys. Well, with the NDAA, uh, they have basically thrown out three quarters of the Bill of Rights, and uh, when Obama signed that, that's effectively the power that he gave to the federal government to do against um, the American people. Well, exactly. It has a lot less to do with terrorism than it does the classic kind of Stalin-esque techniques. And, and of course, it's happened in so many other countries, as you uh, recognize. Now, Virginia has already passed legislation regarding the NDAA, uh, kind of really refuting the idea of kidnapping someone uh, can you tell us the different types of legislation that are going on in Washington State, in Virginia, I believe Maryland and uh, Tennessee are also on the list, among other states, Arizona and Oklahoma as well. Uh, can you talk about what the different states are trying to work on and what other states might be considering this legislation? 
Well, there's a there's a host of states that are already uh, drafting up versions of uh, NDAA nullification bills. Uh, about a month ago, Matt Shea called me up and he said, "Hey, have you heard about this NDAA thing?" And I said, "Well, yeah, absolutely. It's it's you know it's a scary scary thing." And he asked me if Tenth Amendment Center would be willing to help him and a few other legislators from around the republic to to write up a bill to nullify this and to to say no at our state lines. And, and we jumped right on it. Uh, collaboratively, collaboratively came up with a package of four bills that we call the Liberty Preservation Act. And uh, this this, uh, you know, on the lighter end for more timid legislators just identifies it as such. And in certain cases where they feel like going all the way, um, like in Virginia, you mentioned the, the language stating it as kidnapping. Um, they're actually talking about nullifying this and uh, codifying into law penalties and uh, uh, legal action against uh, federal agents that are, that are found guilty of doing this to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to me we have multiple levels of overreach of power. Obviously, you cannot violate the Bill of Rights. Those are guaranteed rights to the individual and to the state, really something central to the Tenth Amendment Center's work. But there's also that overreach of executive power just within the federal government powers and the way it's dispersed among the three branches. And so it seems to me it's all the more important that states take on this issue. And we hope this is something that's going to spread because, unfortunately, the press has not taken on this issue as a major controversy the way it did the Patriot Act. Even though the Patriot Act was not effectively slowed, at least people were aware of the issue. And I don't see that with NDAA. People on the street do not seem to even know what's going on with this. Yeah, they've been a, they've been really effective at keeping it quiet. And of course, you've got these information gatekeepers now that decide what Americans uh, get to know about. And that's that's not how it was supposed to be in the first place either. But uh, regardless, this is where we're at right now. And uh, many states have already realized that the only way they're going to stop this is to do it at the state line. And I might add, it's not restricted to states right now. Uh, we have three counties in Colorado that have already passed uh, resolutions against the NDAA, and we have four cities uh, that have done the same. Uh, in, in Fremont, California, for example, that city, uh, their NDAA legislation uh, also says outright that they will be, uh, you know, imprisoning or le levying fines against federal agents that are, that are kidnapping people in that city. Right. And, uh, you know, we have the TSA issue here in Texas. Uh, the House overwhelmingly voted to bar the TSA from basically doing things that would be considered molestation, a violation of not only privacy, but of the private parts, if you will. And we saw the feds come down, really intimidate the whole system and work with some of their cronies to get it thrown out to make sure it didn't become an example to the country. And then on the opposite side of that, we see countries like Australia passing what may prove to be model legislation, telling people that if they don't go through the body scanners, they can't fly. And uh, that's a really dangerous precedent in my eyes. Uh, what do you see happening, or what did you think anyway, of the situation with Texas and the TSA? And uh, are states gonna continue to fight on those fronts as well? Well, in Texas, you had David Simpson introducing uh, pretty strong TSA legislation last session. Uh, that said, no, you can't do that. You can't grab people. You can't uh, have these scanners operating. They just wanted to get rid of the whole thing. And of course, the federal government shot back with, okay, we won't allow planes to fly in Texas. If you guys pass this, we're just going to shut down all air travel in Texas. And that was their intimidation tactic. Uh, last year, you know, the, the Texas legislator Texas legislature stood alone and they, they uh, the House overwhelmingly, I think they unanimously passed the TSA bill, but the Senate was bullied into, uh, into not doing it. This year we've already got, I think, three or four different states who, who have uh, TSA bills, and that also continues to be a theme, um, but it's, uh, it's not nearly as hot as the NDAA issue right now. Right. Yeah, so with respect to the NDAA, is nullification the only viable route? Is there also room for people to file lawsuits? Uh, and who would that be filed against, do you know? 
I've heard that there's some action that's taking place right now in terms of a multi-plaintiff lawsuit uh, against the federal government over the NDAA. But you always got to come back to what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, it's going to even let's just assume it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Is the federal Supreme Court going to take such a, a hard line against the rest of the federal government? I, I just don't see that happening. And and uh, there's not really a, um, a track record to suggest that that's what would happen. So, yes, I believe that this is where we have to draw the line in our communities, in our states. If we have a decent state house, uh, the county level is great. Uh, if you get a good constitutional sheriff involved in your county, get the county commissioner on board like uh, Peggy Littleton in El Paso County, Colorado, recognized the threat, immediately acted. They had something passed, I think, first out of anybody, any state, any county, any city. And this is what we can do on the local level. This is this is what the Tenth Amendment says. That when the federal government does something that's outside of their carefully set parameters, we, as the the top of the government uh, totem pole in this country, have a right to say no. Yeah, and I think obviously we have to step up and say no because it's clear this tyranny is not going to stop. It's it's on that slippery slope and it's accelerating towards full steam ahead. And so I feel like if we don't stop these kinds of bills from being accepted, we may never have another chance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I talked to Stuart Rhodes about this the other day, he, he said point blank. This is what he studied when he was at Yale uh, finishing his law degree was the, the turning of the domestic homeland into a war zone and applying warfare parameters to your own people. This is what you saw with Germany, this is what you saw with, uh, with uh, the USSR. Um, this was a very common tactic for them to, to apply pressure to activists, to dissidents, to anybody that they wanted out of the way. And that's exactly how it happened. Yeah, classic tyranny. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on nullification. I've always been a little foggy on it. And I feel like it's kind of a very scholarly term. Uh, can you break it down, just totally simplify it for the total average listener for the lowest common denominator of people who understand probably the basic Constitution of Bill of Rights, but maybe not what nullification is all about. Sure. Well, it's essentially you can look to Thomas Jefferson as the one who fleshed out the doctrine. He worked with uh, James Madison to produce the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions in 1798. And at that time, you had a federal government that was jailing newspaper editors for writing things that were, uh, um, you know, stuff that they didn't like about the uh, the executive branch or the, the presidency at that time. They were literally 24 newspaper editors were behind bars. And Thomas Jefferson, who was the vice president at the time, said this is not this is not what we set up. This is not what all those men fought and died for. And he said that the uh, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy anytime the federal government goes outside of the uh, carefully lined boundaries of the Constitution. And I guess it also gets back to the basic Marbury versus Madison, all laws uh, which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void on their face. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's another reference right there. Uh, the bottom line is we've been moved into a place in our zeitgeist where we, uh, a lot, too many people consider the Supreme Court to be the, uh, the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is not constitutional. And that was not the system that we were given by the founders. Uh, we, the people of the several states, are the ones who made an agreement with the federal government, created the federal government. And when it gets out of line, uh, we really need to treat it as an employee or as a servant rather than as this overlord, uh, which is the way people see it right now. Um, this is what we have walked away from as a people. The responsibility falls squarely on the shoulders of the American people uh, for us being in this position right now, and it's up to us to turn it around. Bruce Shanka, obviously NDAA has to be a line in the sand. How could people help? Uh, do they need to contact their county and uh, state representatives? What's the best way to get full momentum on this issue and get it spreading to as many states as possible? Well, first off, go to 10th Amendment .com. Up at the top, there's model legislation button that will show you all of our different bills that we have. Uh, go ahead and grab the Liberty Preservation Act, grab the text, uh, take it, share it with anybody you want to, show it to your legislators, get people talking about it, get people to realize that this is an option. This is the recourse that we have when they do something like uh, give themselves the power to kidnap people. 
uh, get a good look at that bill and then take it to your state house, take it to your county commissioner, take it to your sheriff and say, this is what we want. This is what we demand. Talk to your neighbors about it. Get a group of people, get, you know, a, a bunch of people writing emails and demanding this thing. That's what it will take. Uh, again, uh, Peggy Littleton, the county commissioner in El Paso County, Colorado, the first county to, to do this. Her response to me when I asked her about it was, well, "This is just this is what the people wanted. Uh, this isn't me. This is I'm just I'm just facilitating. And if you've got good representatives at the local level, and you've got enough people together saying we're rejecting this kidnapping provision, then it will happen." And people can afford, of course, find that at tenthamendmentcenter.com. That's right. And your work is at what website? Uh. Sorry? Uh, what was your other website where you have your work posted and, and your articles? Uh, I also edit for the libertyvoice.com, uh, okay. which is just an independent news website. We have some uh, news and commentary on there. And we've been reporting on this and a variety of other issues. Well, let's hope people take, take this issue to the streets and to the representatives we still have, because, of course, we can do things at the state level still. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Good night. And that's all for tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back again tomorrow, and uh, Alex will continue to fill in from the road. Um, join us then, and please consider subscribing to support this broadcast. Help us reach as many people as possible. Turn this back around. Good night.